Major support for Carolina Business Review provided by Colonial Life, providing benefits to employees to help them protect their family, their finances, and their futures. High Point University, the premier life skills university, focused on preparing students for the world as it is going to be. And Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. The much anticipated midterm elections are now days away. We are actually in early voting here across the Carolinas. I'm Chris William and welcome again to the most widely watched and the longest running program on Carolina business policy and public affairs seen each and every week across North and South Carolina. Thank you for supporting it. In a moment, we will unpack. Will it be a surprise control of the Republicans or will it go another way? Uh, one thing you can expect with politics is you can expect the unexpected. We will find out what that means and we start right now. Gratefully acknowledging support by Martin Marietta, a leading provider of natural resource-based building materials, providing the foundation upon which our communities improve and grow. Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Visit us at SouthCarolinaBlues.com. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, a panel discussion featuring Anna Bevan Gravely of NC Free, Andy Shane from The Post and Courier, Dr. Susan Roberts of Davidson College, and Antoine Seawright from Blueprint Strategy. So welcome again to our program and welcome to all of you. Before we start into the dialogue, I want to make a, something we're pretty excited about, and that is we are actually going to be back in the studio. No more of looking down a hallway. No one's more excited than I am, but more importantly, um, back into the studio means um, hopefully in large steps and hopefully all, definitely always, but certainly beginning in November, we will be back in the studio. I'd well, like to welcome all of our panelists who are our, our, our veteran panelists of this program. Uh, Susan, we haven't seen you in a while, but welcome. And Susan, I'm gonna start with you. Yes. Early voting, it seems to be uh, the thing now and becoming more popular. Is it, is it more than a novelty? Is, does early voting say something to you? Well, I think we'd like to think it was a measure of enthusiasm, but um, for some people, it's just convenience. Some states don't have early voting. Some have just a small window of early voting, but I think it's um, a thing that's here, and I think it's not just a pandemic-related phenomenon, but I think it's still more convenience than it is. Everybody's really enthusiastic. Oh, there's some numbers that show high enthusiasm among both Democrats and Republicans for 2022. Mm -hmm. As you speak about it in North Carolina, Susan, I think Andy in South Carolina, it's not brand new, but it's still fairly new. How is, is it gotten traction? What's your thought? Yeah, very much so. I mean, you know, of course, during COVID, we saw the numbers go up, but I think that's going to remain. Uh, you know, everyone remembers how lines have been so long at some of these elections. And of course, we, like everyone else, we've had shortages of, of, of uh, workers to work the polls. So I think to avoid those lines and to, um, of course, just take advantage of the idea that, you know, you don't have to go out on a Tuesday uh, to cast a vote. Uh, we're seeing a lot more of this early voting. A.B., Antoine, let's 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 take this. Is there is there some direct correlation or relationship between early voting numbers as you both see them and just straight up election turnout? Well, I think early voting numbers uh, drive election turnout. In fact, I believe this uh, voting is perhaps the most consequential thing a person can do. What early voting provides is an opportunity for working people to participate. And it's, it serves as an encouragement to for people who do not normally participate in the voting process to participate. Uh, and that's why I'm so proud that South Carolina came together in a bipartisan way to expand opportunities at the ballot box. And I think across the country, we should do more to allow working people an opportunity to participate in their democracy. Mm -hmm. Could yeah, I add one thing? Um, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say just in North Carolina, we've seen um, early voting, but also we have absentee voting. And we're one of the states that um, uniquely, you don't have to say why you're gonna request an absentee ballot. You can just request one 
Um, and that starts even a month earlier than today. Um, and so we've been voting in North Carolina for a while. And I think that puts a lot of pressure on campaigns and campaign advertising. I mean, this morning I was getting ready and in a course of five minutes, there were only political ads and there were three different campaigns and people are getting um, lots and lots of campaign ads. And I think earlier than normal, um, specifically toward the latter part of the summer, we saw a lot of campaign ads to really account for early voting and absentee mm -hmm. voting. And, and, and Chris, in an environment where there's so many efforts to suffocate and suppress the votes of people who look like me, uh, early voting is a strong indication of an opportunity to push back against this idea of suppressing people's votes. The problem or the challenges comes in when you have uh, reasons you have to have to early vote, like South Carolina has had in the past. I think it was 15 or 17 reasons. But most of us have to work on election day. Some travel. Some have all these reasons. So right. no excuse absentee or no excuse early voting okay. works out good for democracy itself. So, Susan, were you trying to get something in? Well, <clears throat> excuse me, I just think long term what this can do with absentee ballots coming in and an increase. Um, it's it's sort of like uh, there's what they call a red mirage that um, Republicans are doing very well on election day. And so people think that's the way the election is going to turn. And that leads to a lot of uncertainty because it's really now election week. I mean, a lot of races will not be decided uh, on election night. Andy, do you get the same? So let's let's shift. Let's talk about the Republicans. Republicans think they are going to take, at least nationally, the House and the Senate. We'll talk about some races in the Carolinas in a second. But Andy, do you think that that's going to come to fruition? Do you think the Republicans will be in charge? You know, again, the sense nationally is that the Republicans have an edge uh, in the House with a, a number of uh, with some uh, races that the Democrats thought were going to be competitive, thought were theirs. Essentially, districts where Biden did well. Um, they're having to fight for their lives. The Senate seems to be very much of a toss up at this point. Um, you know, it, it, you know, the national ebb and flow of momentum for the Democrats seems to have, uh, you know, been been going and then maybe slowing down a little bit as we're heading into the final weeks here, um, you know, before the election. So I think it's a lot of it's going to be just like a football game. You know, who has the ball in the fourth quarter, so to speak? Who has the momentum in those final weeks? Yeah. Uh, can we expect the unexpected, anyone? You, we all know how elections go. Um, Donald Trump in 2016, surprise, surprise. But can we expect the unexpected, even though it seems like some of the races are given, or is it just way too close? Anyone? Look, I think that uh, I'm from South Carolina, where it's never a good idea to predict the weather. Uh, <laughs> three weeks out, three months out, or even four days out, uh, as we all know. Antoine, uh, and I so can make a joke told, about how it's going to rain for five minutes every day during the summer. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so truth safe. be told, we, all, we oftentimes make these predictions based on history. But what we do know about the electric, one, it's become more diverse. Two, more people are paying attention. And three, there's a bigger opportunity to rewrite the narrative of history. And I do believe that Democrats are going to shock people. What polls cannot measure is enthusiasm. And I'm here in Atlanta, Georgia, in real time. What I do know is that when you see the early vote numbers and the people participating early, no poll can measure that. When you see the fact that we have the, some of the most diverse candidates in our nation's history up and down the ballot, and that's going to drive its own set of turnout, no poll can measure that. And we also know that polls are simply a snapshot of the time. They do not define the times. And so I'm cautiously optimistic that history will be rewritten in a different way with the president in power of the party that will end up being in control. Let, let, let me go in a just different direction for just a second, then we're going to talk maybe more specific races. But Anna Bevin, uh, uh, Susan, um, the idea that in North Carolina early in the spring, and Andy, I'm going to give you a chance to articulate this as well uh, in a bit, in North Carolina, for the first time, probably in the state's history, I think that's safe to say, the unaffiliated, registered unaffiliated voter was was more populous than registered D's and registered R's. Does that, will that have a longer term effect beginning now and going forward? Susan, Anna Bevan? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's going to have a huge impact. Um, I saw some, some statistics the other day about how um, we know when it comes to, to map drawing that Republicans live near Republicans, Democrats live near Democrats. Unaffiliated are scattered across the state. There's no real rhyme or reason 
um, they don't really flock to their own. They're scattered everywhere, which that from a from a campaign standpoint and from a just a purely educating voter standpoint, that's complicated. That's really hard. You have to spend more money um, to, to really educate those people, introduce them to you. Um, and that's just going to mean more and more money coming into North Carolina, which is going to then influence more and more. Um, on affiliateds who are moving in based on how quickly our state is growing. Susan, how has it distorted politics in North Carolina? Well, I think it's made it, um, as it does everywhere, very unpredictable. And that uncertainty is something that um, candidates do not want to see. I think it has um, these unmoored voters, as some research I was involved with, they're not, not, not necessarily leaners anymore. We used to say, you know, there's no real true independent they lean one way or the other. That's still yeah. true, but to a lesser extent. Mm -hmm. Andy, what about South Carolina? You don't have to register in South Carolina that I just found out about. Thank you. But does that do you expect that that dynamic is going to have some impact? Uh, as, as the joke I always say about South Carolina is that everybody thinks they're fiercely independent. So, you know, don't tell me who to vote for. But, you know, you know, obviously we see how the results are and uh, come come November. You know, I, I think. You know, there's a lot there's a lot of of who do I like to vote for and whose whose opinions do I want mm -hmm. to go with? I, I I tend to, you know, hear a lot of folks who said I voted Republican here. I voted Democratic here, you know, with a few that, of course, are, are at either end of the spectrum. So it, it, I think that 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 people are looking what whatever issues are important to them, abortion, the economy um, and, and seeing who the candidate is that they think will uh, will fulfill that the best. And, and Antoine, go, go ahead, go ahead please. Yeah, that's a classic North Carolina move. We jump back and forth. Um, President, U.S. Senate, Governor, uh, Council of State, It we've been playing that game for years. And I think the unaffiliated voter is really starting to reflect that in a different way. Uh, let's unpack a little bit about priorities. Andy, you just mentioned it, but Antoine, what do you, what do you think voter sentiment is going to reflect when we look back Right after the election, what will the priorities be? I know they're all up there, uh, the inflation, the economy, abortion, gun rights, education, et cetera, et cetera. But how do you think it's going to prioritize? Well, I think pocketbook issues are going to control the day. Uh, I think it was Bill Clinton who had that wonderful philosophy of thought that said it's the economy stupid. I do think um, the pocketbook issues are going to run the day. In South Carolina, we say bread and butter, barbershop, beauty salon, nail salon issues. In my family, we say the things that keep you up at night, the things that you wake up in the morning thinking about. I remember being on this show just a few months ago, and I told my dear friend Anna Bevan, that she argued with, where she made the case that gas <laughs> prices was going to be the order of the day. And I told her that was only going to be a snapshot and things were going to change. And now people are trying to drum up enthusiasm around inflation. But truth be told, if Democrats were smart, if my party were smart, they would talk about all the things we've done to deal with inflation and what the Republicans refuse to do to assist them in dealing with inflation and point out the fact that inflation is a global issue not just a United States of America issue, and Democrats are not in charge of the world. Well, I would add, too, that I, I'm not sure that, um, you know, the um, the Inflation Reduction Act and promises about infrastructure are going to be part of the voter calculus right now. I think it really has changed. And um, I was thinking that abortion, access to abortion, was going to be a real driver in this election. And in the last few days, I think it's been eclipsed by the economy, by gas and groceries. And um, voters tend to vote short term. I don't know if that's going to be uh, something going into the polls. And as we said, as Chris, as you mentioned, is there going to be an October surprise? I think my October surprise so far is the price of gas and, and groceries. And, um, and that's more an intimate issue. And I think mm -hmm. it may be that I'm wrong and the agenda will look more at the big picture that the Democrats have put forward. I'm just not sure. And, 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 and Chris, I would just tell you, the one thing we have on our side, and this is where our offense is, our defense, the fact that when it comes to lowering the cost of gas, lowering the price of energy, lowering the price of goods and services, and just leveling the playing field, although voters cannot feel it today, Democrats have done it, and Republicans are on the record voting against it. And that's why I think that we have not been strategically smart in delivering our message, talking about this election being a choice versus one versus the other. 
Yeah, let, let, Andy, Anna Bevan, isn't the, and this, this is my words and it's not meant to be leading, but doesn't the pain of this inflation, which is, it's, it's not to overstate it, to say this is historic, not just the, the rise in cost and the rise in energy, but the, what we've been through, isn't this going to be agnostic to those political battles we always do? And it's, it's going to come down to how people are feeling about their own personal finance? Oh, absolutely. It is 100% how you're feeling about um, coffee going up 17.7%. That's coffee. I bring that up because that is super important to us political people. We need it, especially right now. And you've got bread and butter, like these major issues that Antoine mentioned earlier that are just not seeing a break. And so what we could spend in the grocery store now gets us half, a fourth depending on what it is. And that's what people are remembering. I think my surprise, and I think Susan, you um, somewhat like alluded to an October surprise, um, is definitely that the Democrats keep holding on to the message of abortion. They keep pushing um, that as a major driver um, and in trying to, to really ignite and get people to show up to the polls, whether it's early voting or on election day, around the issue of abortion. Um, the messaging that is even even MSNBC is starting to talk about how that is that's not the right move. And when you have crime and safety moving above abortion, the economy, um, pocketbook issues, inflation, mm -hmm. all of those are being broken out separately in different line items that are surpassing the issue of abortion. Um, and really, it's just resting on the economy and crime and safety. Andy? And, and, hold on and, a second. And, 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 I know you want to respond to Antoine, hold on just a second, because I know you, if we let it, you two, will, I know you lovingly go at it. <laughs> Love it. Love that part of you, both of you. But Andy, I want to give you a chance to shoehorn something into this. I mean, so how do you feel about these, these issues that we've talked about it? Well, first of all, I feel like I should have a Brafs uniform on, but um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but yeah, uh, uh, but no, honestly, uh, you know, I, I do think that you know, again, what I'm hearing anecdotally, or uh, you know, and, and around here in Colombia and other parts, is it, just that it's 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 how do I feel about sort of the the direction of the country and the direction of the economy? Um, you know, to a certain degree, again, yes, there's a lot of anger, uh, you know, among among a large group of people about uh, about the abortion situation. But in the end, I think that that people care about those again, those those immediate touchstones that they have when they go to the grocery store, when they're trying to buy birthday presents or buy a Halloween costume this time of year or or and again, also about crime, even if it's not happening in your neighborhood, there's just this perception. And again, the Republicans have been doing a very, I think, a very effective job of saying there's a lot of danger out there. There's a lot of issues going on, and this is who you need to blame for it. Even again, if you, even if you've not been the direct um, victim of any of these crimes, um, let's 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 unpack some local races. Um, Susan, what do you think is key to watch in North Carolina? Really, what's going to be what what are going to be the races that really impact people, and not and not just the national headlines, but it could mean something closer to home where you are. Well, I think um, looking at uh, Bradford and Beasley is going to be an important race. We've had in the past. This is the race, is the pivotal race that'll uh, change control of the Senate or capture it or lose it. I think it's really number, you know, it's not one of the top five races in terms of being the race to watch. Here's, you know, I know about that. Here's something I don't know about. And that is, I don't know about all the races and all the Senate uh, seats and House districts, but control of um, the legislature is very important. If they can get control of both the House, if the Republicans can get the supermajority, it's going to have a big impact than, than we don't, you know, I don't think it's calculable at this time. So I think um, both things are important if you look at the Senate race, but also some of the other races. And um, we don't have a lot of, as um, Anna Bound said, we don't have a lot of races in which you might split tickets. Uh, except at um, the lower level. So I think it's it's two pronged. The Senate race is very important for control. The House races and Senate races in North Carolina are um, very important for the supermajority and what will go forward. And that will cut, that will hit some issues like education and access to abortion. 
Antoine, in South Carolina, do you see anything? I know that there's a Cunningham McMaster uh, gubernatorial thing going on, but is there a is there something that could be crucial or key or any surprises? You know, of course, I'm paying I'm paying attention to all the races because I believe in this idea that the closer your government is to you, the more important it is for you. Uh, and what we've seen is this uh, oversized effort by Republicans to take over General Assembly, but even more so than that, school board races and local races have been more critically important to I think the entire political ecosystem. So watching that, I think that one of the bigger races to watch quietly in South Carolina is our Superintendent of Education, which we have a candidate who who did not meet the quality when she won the nomination to be the superintendent of education. And while I, within three to four months, she received a, 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 a secondary degree, a second degree in order to meet the qualifications should she win. I think teachers and others who've had to work hard to earn their graduate degrees like me uh, feel some type of way about that. So I'll be curious to see what the, um, what the response is to that at the ballot box for those who are actually in tune and paying attention. Because in South Carolina, we may not win other statewide races, but the superintendent of education race has always been one to pay close attention to. Mm -hmm. Andy, what do you think? <clears throat> Andy? I'm sorry, we talking to me or Anna? Yeah, no, I'm sorry, they do sound familiar. Uh, they do, similar. yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, Andy, Andy, what do you think coming off of uh, Antoine's comments? Oh, sure. Uh, no, I, I was, I said, in fact, he, I was going to mention the superintendent race. I mean, that's yeah. in a weird, in a way that's a bellwether because it's, again, it gets a little bit to the, to, to the, to the culture issues that are going on nationally about, um, you know, again, how do we educate our children? Uh, do we, do we find alternatives uh, to, in, in, to the public education system? Um, you know, and, and again, what, what ideology essentially is going to win out um, uh, in this? So we have a race between, uh, you know, someone who's been with a basically conservative think tank, uh, and and looking at some of these some of these alternative issues uh, in education, and then we also have someone who's been a um, uh, you know a huge advocate uh, in, yeah. um, getting teachers together to, for pay and for other things. So it's it's going to be that's I think that's a really a big bellwether race. But I think the nickel question here is we're a red state. Is there anything that's really out there to prove that we are going to re really adjust that even in a race like superintendent of education that might you know, when we might have some people going over to the Democratic side more than, say, the governor's race. Yeah, you know, just as a sidebar, as you, as you both mentioned the superintendent of education, of course, Molly Spearman, current uh, superintendent. I mean, she's really and this is this is not leading, but she really has defined that role as being important, not that education wasn't, but the way that she approached it. She all, all of a sudden makes that office plus plus because of her leadership and because of the perfect storm that education is that critical in the Palmetto State and, and in North Carolina. Would that be accurate to say? Andy or Antoine? You want to take that, Antoine? About no, this was probably about, Andy. Now, this was about Molly Spearman's leadership and how she, and, you know, I didn't even want to spend a lot of time on this, but she kind of defined that role as being a crucial well, I th flight. I, th I think what she did was she defined a role in being willing, even though elected as a Republican, yeah. being willing to work across the aisle with Democrats in the General Assembly and get anything done legislative wise, but also being a teacher engaged superintendent, meaning she cared about what administrators think, thought, she cared about what teachers thought. She also cared about what bus driving, some of the other collective folks that make up the education ecosystem. And that's a breath of fresh air in South Carolina compared to uh, the previous superintendents. And I think she took the politici politicization of that role out of it and made it more of a specialty role. Uh, Anna, we, Anna Bevan, we have, have two minutes left. I want to give you a chance to wade in on what you're watching and also what you're watching now following some reapportionment that has gone on. What do you think is important to watch here? Yeah, I think the the key conversation, and Susan touched on this, is really the supermajority question. Will the will the General Assembly in North Carolina, the Republicans, get a supermajority in the House and the Senate? Um, I I would have said at the beginning of the summer, and have said that it that the House was not going to get a supermajority. However, we've gotten closer and closer to the election. I think that there's that's a really great option. And it looks like it's going to happen for them. Um, the races that I find most interesting are the ones the governor's involved in. So our governor took a, an unprecedented move in getting involved in um, two primaries in the Senate. And the incumbent that he advocated against lost. 
So the governor got his way. What, which one? Uh, what are you talking about specifically? Yeah, there's a there's a race in um, in far northern um, eastern North Carolina and in Fayetteville um, yeah. where the governor got involved and advocated against the incumbent. Um, one specifically because uh, he voted against the governor um, and was more likely to lean toward um, the Republicans. He was a true moderate um, in a place where uh, it, that's just really hard. And that was not something that our governor was interested in, in maintaining. And since then, he has gotten involved in four different Senate races. He stay, kept his focus on the Senate because um, I, I think like mm -hmm. many, many people were looking at it and thinking that that was the best um, shot for him to really, um, they had the greatest opportunity for a supermajority, and that was where he was going to spend his time and energy. Um, and he is uses, using the messaging of abortion, backing female candidates, um, which is, all of this is okay. very new and yeah. super unprecedented. Th th thank you. I, I wish we had more time, but but that has been uh, a little antithetical of what Governor Cooper in North Carolina has done in the past. Thank you. Thank you all. Susan, good to have you back. Andy, nice to nice. see you. We didn't intentionally kick Antoine out. Something happened, but we'll <laughs> we'll have him back. I promise. I'll just, uh, I'll just say I, I'll, I'll say I'll say thank you for everyone. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you all. Uh, vote. Uh, have a good weekend. Until next week. Good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review provided by. High Point University, Martin Marietta, Colonial Life, The Duke Endowment, Sonoco, Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, and by viewers like you. Thank you.